My name is Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us both in person and online. This fireside chat is on digital safety and trust. Fardzana Badi'i, Head of Outreach and Engagement at Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, will be facilitating this chat. She is the founder of Digital Medusa, an initiative that works at the intersection of values in the global digital space and good governance. Enjoy the discussion. Hello everybody, my name is Farzana Badi and uh, we have a fireside chat today with uh, Clint Smith from Discord, David Graff from Google and Tara Awadwa from TikTok. And I'm going, so the session is going to be about global trust and safety for a global internet. And as we know, uh, the internet is global and the services on the internet, we try to provide those services globally for everyone. So the trust and safety should also have a global aspect to it. But so uh, in this fireside chat, so the, the name, the term fireside chat, I've been talking to friends, why do we call these fireside chats? And um, they said, oh, well, maybe we can have the most uncomfortable uh, conversations in a comfortable way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I got my inf inflammable uh, dress on. So, <laughs> so um, but... Uh, so Clint, uh, going to you. so we are going to talk about trust and safety. So, what is global trust and safety for you, and how how does uh, how do you provide glo a global trust and safety at Discord? Sure. Yeah. So I'm Clint Smith. I'm the chief legal officer at Discord. I'm also responsible for safety and privacy and security. Uh, and for us, safety is a fundamental part of our obligation to our users. We want everyone to have a consistently safe experience on Discord, and we invest aggressively in preventing harm from happening, in responding to notices of harm, and to empowering our users, giving our users tools and resources to protect themselves. And uh, you may be wondering you know, why I'm here at RightsCon, and uh, it's to be uncomfortable. You use the word uncomfortable, right? And uh, a representative of a big global company came up to me yesterday and said, this can be a tough crowd, isn't it? And I said, yes, but, but that's why I'm here. I think when you're uncomfortable, you learn and you grow. And I'm thinking back to our first fireside chat at RightsCon three years ago. You asked me about restorative justice. I had only been at Discord three months. I'd never thought about restorative justice, but I went back to my team. I went back to the Discord policy team and said, how can we practice restorative justice? This came up at RightsCon. And we started thinking about strike systems and appeals and warnings rather than bans. And more recently in a policy around um, eating disorders, we realized you shouldn't ban someone who talks and promotes an eating disorder. You should connect them with resources so that they can educate themselves and then rejoin the community with their friends. So I'm here to be uncomfortable and I'm here to learn. And when you catch me with things like what is restorative justice, so you make us better at delivering on our trust and safety commitments to our users. Great, thank you. And David, so why are we here on this stage? And uh, why are we doing <laughs> this? Well, I'm, I'm also here to see Clint uh, get uncomfortable. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, no, thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to be at RightsCon. This is my first RightsCon, uh, RightsCon experience. So I'm David Graff. I'm a VP in the Trust and Safety Department at Google. So for us, when we think about global trust and safety, uh, you know, ultimately, we want all of the users of our various products and services to, uh, to be able to engage productively and constructively. That means to be free from 
harassment and harm and uh, all sorts of uh, other types of abuse, but also to have experiences that they find trustworthy, that they find uh, validating and engaging, uh, and so that they understand essentially the value proposition, what they're getting, what they're giving when they use our products. So for me, trust and safety is, uh, is it's an interesting approach because it, it uh, encompasses both safety aspects and abuse fighting, which is really, really important, but also the more amorphous concepts of trust. What, is it, what does it mean to foster a, a positive user experience? What does it mean to create systems and policies and processes so users feel like that they are benefiting from your services in not just the obvious ways, but, uh, but in all the ways that folks benefit from larger communities. So uh, I think that's really important as far as the global aspect. Uh, the challenge that I think we all face is that global frameworks allow for more scalable enforcement, right? They allow for uh, the potential reflection of corporate values and ideologies across uh, a lot of different spaces. Um, but the challenge is that we also want to make sure that our approaches have a fair amount of regional uh, sort of tailoring, that we're respecting local norms and, and various cultural nuances. So that tension, that tension is, is very real, I think, in a global trust and safety framework. Great. Thank you. And Tara, over to you. Yeah, thank you. It's such a privilege to be here at RightsCon, so thank you for this invitation. Uh, my name is Tara Wadwa, and I serve as the head of regional policy in trust and safety for TikTok. Um, what brings me to this forum here today is thinking about how we create universal principles around trust and safety, particularly around safety policy, and how we then think through how do we respect global norms and universal principles while also bringing a level of community aspect to that. So in my role, we have well, generally in trust and safety, we have over 40,000 people around the world working to institute trust and safety, whether it's through our policies or processes like enforcement. Um, but particularly in my role, we have over 100 people working in 70 countries to uh, localize our policies so that we're observing the local culture, the local language, and the local communities um, so that no one-size-fits-all approach is taken, but instead we're really saying, how can we meet the communities that we're operating in and best serve their trust and safety needs? So hate speech in the UK looks very different than it does here in Costa Rica. Slang will vary and those terms evolve, which is why it's still a persistent problem. Um, and how are we making sure we're taking that into account? Um, another example that comes up is we have a policy against graphic animal abuse, but we have to remember that that can be a concept that is something that can be westernized. And in some other parts of the world, that's a concept that is a tradition around um, food preparation and religious rights. And so how are we making sure that we're not taking that one size fits all approach and instead really looking to examine how that uh, surfaces in each, in each of the countries that we operate and that we're really looking to to local experts on the ground. And so that's the approach that I have the privilege of taking so that we're really looking to human dignity approaches and letting, our, letting the communities themselves speak out and creating policies around that. So we're really looking to safety and not towards exporting uh, different conceptions of values. Great, thank you so much. So I forgot to um, tell the audience that if you have a QR code on the back of your uh, badge, so you can, um, uh, you can scan that and ask your questions. We want this to be a kind of like a conversation with the audience. So if you have questions, just let us know and uh, we can just go to uh, them right away or after uh, we have the initial uh, conversation. Uh, and I'm monitoring the chat and it, there's absolutely nothing, like nobody's chatting so, <laughs> with us at the moment. <laughs> so we can sit comfortably for now. <laughs> so um, what is the role of industry standards uh, in providing some kind of basic framework for, uh, because it is very difficult to do global trust and safety, especially for smaller uh, players. Yeah. But we say that internet is for everyone, so trust is, and safety is for everyone too. Yeah. But how can we actually use 
some kind of like industry best practices or industry standards to provide that basic uh, safe framework. Yeah. For two so speaking from the perspective of a mid-sized company, industry standards are absolutely essential. Uh, I admire the resources that you know, Tara and David uh, have at their companies. At Discord, fully 15% of our company works on trust and safety, but we're only a 1,000-person company at this stage. So we don't have the resources of the larger companies, even though our investment is significant. So we were founding members of the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership that is setting standards uh, around trust and safety. And it's so valuable to us to come together with both the largest platforms like Meta and Google and Microsoft and TikTok and mid-sized companies like Reddit and Pinterest and Discord. And we come together as a group and say, with these very diverse products, what are the common principles we should all be following? And a, a Discord can then take those principles back inside the company and practice them. And one of our principles is around external contacts. And so we take that principle and we come back and say, OK, uh, the you know, people writing platform policies for Discord are all Americans. They're college-educated Americans. They live in metropolitan areas. That's not the most diverse group of people writing platform policies. So let's hire some professors with unique points of view. Let's hire some uh, academics with unique points of view. And then, most recently, we've launched a policy fellows program to bring in people from different parts of the world to advise on our platform policies. But that directly came from DTSP and this principle around what is your external outreach to make your policies better. And we took from DTSP and we applied it internally. And now we'll be getting input on our policies from people in Ghana and Kenya and Colombia and Chile and other countries because of DTSP nudging us in that direction. Yeah, and DTSP is Digital Trust and Safety Partnership and Industry Consortium for uh, a best trust and safety best practices and uh, we have like a third party assessment of these best practices as well. Thank yeah. you so much. David, over to you. Well, I, I mean, I very much agree, all right? I think that uh, it's essential for uh, there to be a couple of things, for there to be an opportunity for companies like ours to be able to get together and discuss the issues and share best practices. We should be leaning into externalizing best practices so that new companies that are, are coming up and that are innovating get the benefit of our, of our knowledge and experience in this area. This isn't an area where we should, uh, we should consider ourselves to essentially have a competitive advantage. We're all, I think, uh, I think appropriately incentivized to fight against hate and harassment and all sorts of other uh, social harms. So I think sharing best practices and, sh and, and more importantly, I suppose, sharing the thinking behind the best practices, sharing how we think about and approach these issues so people can kind of come along on the journey with us is really important. Uh, one thing Clint mentioned, which I think is, is also critically important, is that um, it's really important when I think you do this work to have a diversity of perspectives and views and I mean, on all sorts of metrics, uh, but, but regional perspectives are, are, are sort of particularly important. And it can be tough for each of us, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, we're a big company with lots of resources, but to sort of find people all across the world, right, who can give us that sort of regional lens or that cultural fluency or that linguistic fluency. So there's an opportunity, I think, for some of the industry associations to really fund research in particular areas, in particular regions, and then, and then sort of share that knowledge out among among all the platforms. So we have a more nuanced view, let's say, of a particular issue in Ghana or a particular issue in Costa Rica or a particular set of concerns in uh, another part of the world. So I think I'm a big fan of, of uh, industry getting together, industry best practices, and I see additional ways in which uh, these associations like the DTSP can, can help drive the conversation. Thank you. So, Atar, I'm going to ask uh, a difficult question. So, <laughs> so I'm glad Tara gets the difficult question. <laughs> well, I'm going to come to you as well with that difficult question. So, uh, there is an argument to, uh, to be made that um, when we come up with these kind of like when the industry comes together and uh, everybody kind of like has the same kind of policies and they copy each other, mm -hmm. then they probably <clears throat> uh, repeat the same mistakes. Um, and uh, uh, you know, how, and they can't be innovative in their uh, policy, um, uh, in the policies, and uh, coming up with various uh, methods. So, kind of like, there is an argument that uh, criticizes um, not necessarily standardization, but having like a, like big companies coming together 
in, including small companies, mm -hmm. and then um, influencing each other. So. Uh, what is your comment about yeah, that? Yeah, my take on that, right? <laughs> so, first of all, I couldn't agree more with both what Clint and David were saying previously, that there, is, there are frameworks that should be standardized that codify best practices and lessons learned. And two, two concrete examples of this are hash sharing that we've learned with tech against terrorism, for example, or the reporting mechanism that we have against child sexual abuse material with NECMEC, for example. Those are ways that we've not only limited the proliferation of this type of content on our platforms, but we've also stamped out bad actors that are creating this content in the real world harm that happens from our day to day lives. So I think those are really positive examples of how we as an industry have come together, not only to stop the proliferation of the content on platforms, but to stop it from happening at the source in real life. But as you say, how can we ensure that this one-size-fits-all approach isn't something that prevents us from being innovative, right? And I think something we need to be cognizant of is Clint's platform varies very differently from the different types of services that Google provides, and TikTok has its own offerings that are very different as well. And so this one-size-fits-all approach needs to meld to, to be sure that we're offering policies that are bespoke enough to the types of services that we are providing. So TikTok is a short form video app that also has a live streaming service that also um, is innovating and thinking of different uh, product offerings um, that we're always trying to experiment with. And so having it's a yes and approach. It's never going to be a only this type. So I always like to think of it as we're trying to create frameworks, but those frameworks are not going to be enough. They need to be built upon by each of the companies. So an example there is we all face um, elections in all the various countries that we operate in. It's a, a pretty normal process. And in that in that use case, each of the countries face different uh, types of di power dynamics, different misinformation trends that we've talked so much about here at RightsCon that's been so beneficial to us all. And in facing that, there'll be different linguistic problems that we'll have, there'll be different power dynamics that will come up in each of those elections, and we can't simply apply a framework and call it the end of the day. Instead, we'll have to think through who are our resources on the ground, who are the civil society organizations and academics that we should be consulting with, and how do we take those frameworks that we could consider, consider industry standard and then apply them with our resources on the ground and as Clint says, the invaluable civil society experts to say, what is the bespoke strategy that we'll need then? So I really do see it as a yes and sort of situation. Yeah, yeah great. Yeah. Well, I can, Tara, can I share another example, I think, building on what Tara said of yeah. how this works in practice when companies are setting standards and sharing information? Uh, two years ago, Twitch published their off-platform behavior policy. So if a Twitch streamer does something off-platform, you know, what does Twitch do about that in their content moderation? And they came around to a few companies, including Discord, to explain their position. It was really interesting to hear how thoughtful they had been in light of their service and their business model. And then we said, we need to make a similar statement about off-platform behavior and how we take that into account in our content moderation decisions. But we're a very different service. We don't have a rev share with streamers. We don't have sort of celebrities uh, on our platform that we have a rev share with. We have you know, small friend groups and interest group communities that are fairly self-contained and, and invite only. So we came up and published our own policy, which is very different than Twitch's, but it was Twitch doing that that was a catalyst for us announcing and defining our policy. And then I just saw that Twitch had its human rights impact statement come out this week. I'm gonna read that this afternoon because I'm very interested to see what the Twitch HRIA says and how it can inform our work around human rights principles. Great, thank you. And David, do you have a comment? Now that Tara has made it easier. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like Tara getting the tough questions. Um, well, I. I Look, I, I agree with what both Tara and Clint have had to say. I think what is really important is when we are when we are discussing policy issues, if we're part of an industry association or gathering and we're discussing policy issues, it's it's in a sense less important to just sort of review the language of the policy and more important to sort of understand the thinking behind it, as, as Clint was saying. And I think it's one of the things that, it's one of the main benefits of industry associations. Anybody, our policies are, are largely externalized, so one could go and copy them and read them, and, and that would give you some understanding. But I think you really want to understand the approach 
right, that people take. Because as my colleagues have pointed out, our platforms are different. So just taking, taking a look at the policy may not, the externalized policy may not help you. But when we, so for example, when we approach policy issues um, at, at Google, um, because we have so many different products, which do different things, which serve fundamentally different purposes and different audiences, we start with thinking about, we start by thinking about, we sort of refer to it as product ethos. Like, what is this product, what is its value proposition? What is its purpose? What is, it, what is the benefit it is trying to bring to the world? What is the good thing that it is trying to bring to society? Can we have a, a sense of that? And then we start the exercise of, okay, well, these are the great, these are the use cases we like. These are some use cases we might find problematic. Do the benefits outweigh the risks? Can we begin to mitigate the risks? But when you do that, you start to get to, I think, sort of a fundamentally important point, which is, the principle that undergirds your policy framework has to be directly tied to that product's purpose and mission, right? Uh, it, it can't be sort of a generic principle. It needs to be intricately tied or intimately tied to what it is you're trying to accomplish. And that allows you to have differentiation among your products. Uh, folks know that Google search, organic search, has its own ethos and its own approach to reflecting the world. And that's very different from, um, from play from the Play Store, right, which is, which is a store uh, and which provides both a platform and a store providing opportunities for developers and for users. So I think it's thinking about that approach and perhaps, I won't say teaching, sharing that approach with lots of folks would be, uh, is, is I think particularly useful and beneficial. Great, thank you. And we have a question. Um, from the audience, uh, would love to know how partnerships play a role in elevating the platform's trust and safety for youth. So, Clint, maybe we start from you. Yeah. So we do have a young demographic <laughs> on Discord. Uh, more than half of our users are 13 to 24, and only 20% of our users are over 35. So we focus a lot on, on young people and their experience on Discord. The partnerships are absolutely essential. Uh, we have a partnership with the Digital Wellness Lab in Boston, which is run by pediatricians, the Family Online Safety Institute, uh, and various groups around the world that focus on uh, healthy online experiences for, for teens. And uh, we engage with them so we can bring ideas back to the product managers, bring ideas back to the people who write articles for our safety center and our privacy center. and. Uh, we learn a tremendous amount through these partnerships. Uh, an area that we'd like to explore more is sponsored research. So we're you know, very concerned about the mental health crisis that's a global crisis that disproportionately impacts young people. And uh, we think more research into mental health outcomes and the impact of the different apps that are on our teenagers' phones is an area that collectively we need to explore and, and collectively we need to solve. I'm going to make you uncomfortable now and ask yeah. a question. Yeah. <laughs> so when we talk about youth, we always talk about their mental health and their uh, safety. How about their privacy? How about their freedom of expression? How about uh, enabling them to express themselves freely and I have access to information? What, do, what are we doing about yeah. th those aspects? Yeah. There's some elements of the Discord product design that we're very proud of. The first is there's no real names policy. So you can present as you want to present when you choose your username. And you can also change your username and avatar as you engage in different communities. So someone who's exploring their identity, someone especially a, a teen whose identity is in a stage of formation, has a lot of benefits using Discord as compared to some other products. And we get really positive feedback on that. And then coming in July, we have our uh, family center, and it's not the traditional parental control. We've designed it to give agency to the teenagers. So the teenagers, if they want to, will invite an adult to look over their account. The adults will have no access to message content, so we're preserving the privacy of the teenager, but the adults would be able to see what friends you're connecting with and what communities you are joining. But the key to the design is that the teenager has agency and invites in an adult to look at their Discord activity, and it's not a parental control. So these are some of the ways we're delivering on privacy for teens, and we are thoughtful about it, and we love talking to teens about how they use our product and hearing suggestions for how to make it better. Great, thank you. David? Uh, well, I think partnerships, and I'm gonna echo some of what Clint said, partnerships are vitally important, right? Partnerships allow us to 
uh, hear from communities that uh, perhaps we don't get to engage with on a sort of day-to-day basis or a week-to-week basis. Uh, a lot of the partnerships we have uh, provide us with really interesting and compelling research on issues that are, are important to us, but but in the grand scheme of things, we don't perhaps have as much time to sort of dedicate to the, that research as we'd like. So the partnerships are really, really important, including youth partnerships. I think when it comes to uh, when it comes to sort of the state of youth today and the, and, and what is a, an acute mental health crisis, I mean, I very much agree with Clint. We want our platforms to be used as, uh, we want people to be able to use our platforms to explore difficult and challenging questions around identity, around their life's work and mission, around their friend groups, around their various ideologies. Um, we And so we work very hard to create a space where people can explore those topics. I will sometimes joke with folks that, you know, our policies are not designed to prevent users from encountering ideas that they find disturbing or even somewhat offensive or somewhat polarizing, or I should say perhaps that challenge their worldview, right, and challenge their sense of identity. We want that to happen. We just want that to happen, obviously, in a way that is constructive and productive. We don't want people to feel, want people to feel that they can sort of engage safely and they can share ideas and they can share uh, thoughts uh, without fear of somehow being bullied or harassed or sort of <laughs> crowdsourced somehow off the platform. Uh, so our partnerships work, I think, really helps us helps us think about that and it gives us a, a, a good window into the concerns that various constituencies and communities have. Great, thank you. Tara, some, one of the most favorite apps for the youth. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, we have an organization dedicated to partnership, so it's called our or- Outreach and Partnerships Management Organization. And my colleague Lucia is here, who will be blushing now that I've mentioned her name. Um, and she's actually dedicated to youth partnerships. And we've structured that organization in two ways. One is um, a centralized hub that works with our policy development folks, both in regional policy and in our what we call issue-based policy, who work with youth safety and wellness in particular. So as they craft policies dedicated to youth safety and wellness, who are the academics, who are the um, civil society organizations that they'd like to work with to make sure, like Boston Children's Hospital, to make sure that as we're crafting them, we're checking that we're making the right headway in those policies. The other side is focused on regional outreach. So in Singapore, we have a hub in San Francisco and in LA, and also in Dublin, we have hubs. And how are we making sure that that regional outreach is happening across the 70 different countries that we work in so that we're not taking any one uh, lens towards our youth safety and well-being policies? And as we localize them, we're making sure it's a ground truth with the different communities that we work in. Um, so we have different youth safety and wellness organizations on the ground that we work with as well. And I think in this way, it's really important to gut check that we're, we're making sure we're taking care of all the different types of constituents. But what we heard was there's not a lot of conversations between parents and, and youth in this space. And instead, the youth are kind of going off on their own and with their friends discovering the internet and therefore discovering a whole world, whether it be their identity or the interactions they're having. And in some ways it's detrimental to the type of bullying that they encounter online or the type of uncomfortable content they might face. And instead of having conversations with their parents or a trusted adult, they're doing that and facing that on their own, which can be a very isolating experience. So we have what's called family pairing, which is opening up a dialogue between parents and um, the youth that have the, that are the account holders here so that they are having these uncomfortable conversations with one another. And it gives both the youth and the adult the opportunity to open up that dialogue. It's just as uncomfortable for parents, I would note, as it is for the young adults on the platform. And so it gives them tips as well. And I think that's a really important space to start opening up because you can't depend solely on the youth to do it, nor can you on the adults. So we're trying to see where we can open up that space a bit more. Great. So uh, my follow-up uh, question would be, as in some countries and uh, re- uh, regions, youth is not really mobilized. They, they don't have groups. They don't, um, especially in some um, 
countries with uh, problematic uh, politics. So uh, do you have any, uh, when the youth is not mobilized and they can't do uh, collective action, you cannot seek uh, advice from them and you cannot engage with them. Is there any backup plan for that kind of vulnerable community? That's such an important question. So one of the things that Lucia and her team has been able to do is we know where the eyeballs are. It is in that search in that search bar, and we know what they're looking to look up. And so we want to bring the experts to where the eyeballs are. So, for example, we have a global um, a global partnership with the Suicide Prevention Hotline, and that brings a chat box into our app, so that when youth are looking up those problematic terms like "I want to kill myself" or other terms like that it automatically doesn't show search results. Instead, it will, pr it will connect them to the suicide prevention hotline, and they can start a dialogue immediately right from there. And with this partnership, they saw the number of communications that began to open up skyrocket as a result, because they didn't have to go out even outside of the app. They were able to just continue that dialogue inside the app. So we're trying to bring the experts to meet with the youth right exactly where they're already looking in app on TikTok. Great, thank you very much. So uh, we can now, I believe, go to the very interesting question that um, a lot of civil society organizations are very interested in. And um, so we were having conversations about how um, human rights uh, framework is being sidelined and being replaced by trust and safety. And there is this argument uh, that some civil society organizations are making that we need to think, uh, talk and think more about human rights and uh, trust and safety should not be uh, the uh, dominant conversation. And, um, but another uh, perspective is that but these trust and safety best practices and the oper operational aspects of it can actually contribute to human rights and uh, can advance uh, these uh, human rights uh, values so what is your opinion about this um, how do, how can we make trust and safety uh, human uh, align with human rights uh, globally, of course, I'm talking about. <laughs> so go ahead, Clint. Yeah, we're early uh, in our journey here uh, on implementing human rights both into our product design and our policies, but we actually see a lot of compatibility. So in our safety by design work, the UN guiding principles are very useful to us. And I think a lot of the fundamental human rights are reflected in our goal of designing a safe product. So I don't think they're incompatible at all. In fact, I think using the human rights frameworks and infusing that both into product design as well as in the development of our platform policies is a very you know, important initiative. And uh, so you, uh, I think you recently did a human rights impact assessment or are you in the process? Not yet. So we've yes. retained you know, <laughs> BSR for guidance. Uh, right. We have a, a cross-functional group working on how to infuse human rights both into our product and our policy and our partnerships. But we haven't formally done an impact assessment. We're still at the early stages of our work on human rights. Okay, that's great. And then... Um, do you see that that kind of work in the human rights impact assessment could actually help with the trust and safety part of? I see it very compatible. So, you know, if a human rights expert looked at the DTSP principles, uh, they would see a lot of common ground with the, you know, principles that a human rights uh, expert cares about and the principles that are codified in our DTSP best practices. There's a lot of common ground. And uh, I invite actually human rights experts to, do, to partner with DTSP and give us feedback on that because I think fundamentally we want our standards to reflect human rights principles. That's great. Thank you. David. Yeah, I, I very much agree. I mean, I think a, a very strong, a strong trust and safety uh, foundation and framework has to rest on a, a, a set of values, and one set of those values are, are, are values around human rights. So I think, to, to Clint's point, I mean, they're they're not only compatible. I mean, the the two have to be sort of merged and married together in order to have, I think, an effective trust and safety uh, uh, regime. Um, I mean, I think 
as we think about our, our policies and our enforcement, we very much take into consideration human rights. We have, now I'll embarrass one of my colleagues, we have uh, one of my colleagues, Alex Walden, is our executive who's essentially in charge of Google's approach to human rights and thinking about human rights. And we have a human rights executive council that, that I sit on and which, which Alex brings together senior executives across the, the company. And we think and dis we think about these issues, we discuss these issues, perhaps most importantly, we listen to the experts who know what they're talking about and they share their, their thoughts and their research with us. And that guides our approach to uh, both designing uh, content policies and to thinking about current issues and how we're going to handle evolving and dynamic uh, uh, situations in other parts of the world and how we want to sort of tailor our response. So, I mean, I think it's uh, thinking about human rights is, I think, essential right, to developing a, a robust global trust and safety framework. I really don't see how you could do it without, without uh, taking human rights into consideration. Great. Thank you, Tara. Over to you. Uh, if you'll allow me to be personally indulgent for a moment, before I joined Trust and Safety in the tech world, my mentor and where I was before was a human rights advocate, and he had the Center for Human and uh, Business and Human Rights. And so I actually joined because his advice is don't stay on the outside, go into the belly of the beast and figure it out. Um, and so that's that was the inspiration behind trying to get into tech policy and figure figure these issues out that are thorny and difficult, but inspiring nonetheless. And your colleague Alex is one of those people that uh, brought us into this space. So I think that's one of the things. And as you were speaking about with human rights impact assessments, we worked with Article 1 to do our first human rights impact assessment um, at TikTok just this, in 2022. And it's formative for how we'll think about um, our work in 2023, but our community principles are formed on the basis of that human rights impact assessment as well as the UN guiding principles on human rights. Um, and as we think about the trade-offs between that we have to make when we think about our policies and the principles between human dignity and the trade-offs of freedom of expression and keeping our community safe, it often comes down to what does the International Code of Human Rights say and how, does, how do we lean on that as a guiding principle? So they're embedded and codified in how we think through these things and the conversations that we have every day when we face really tough issues. So um, I understand that we might not always articulate that as eloquently publicly as maybe some in civil society would like, but I hope that we can do a better job of making them, of making sure that they're heard and that they know that those are the things that are embedded in the conversations that we have every day and that go into formulating our policies. That's exactly the issue that this kind of like balancing and a trade-off because we are, uh, arguing that the, our civic spaces uh, by a lot of takedown and uh, monitoring and kind of like preventative uh, measures, it could be shrinking. And um, of course, obviously we want to have um, a civil uh, civic space, but then with uh, heavy moderation and uh, some of the trust and safety uh, practices, if they are not based on human, uh, human rights and uh, universal values, uh, it could um, have major effects on our like democracy and uh, freedom of expression and values like that. So the trade-offs and balancing, it's, it's very hard. Nobody gets it right. And, uh, but uh, uh, I really appreciate the uh, responses. I think that uh, at least you're thinking about it and uh, there, is the, there are the frameworks to work with. And uh, hopefully um, there will be like civil society organizations are very strong in human rights impact assessment and uh, we can use their diverse expertise in the future to um, uh, in, infuse those uh, human rights values into your policies. So we have actually a few questions. Um, this one is good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how are recent layoffs of trust and safety staff affecting the uh, ability to uphold TNS commitments, develop new policies, account for regional perspectives, etc.? Et I'll start from you, David. 
I was hoping you were going to start with Clint or Tara no. again. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, look, I uh, obviously, as everybody knows, there have been a series of uh, reductions in force across uh, a number of companies in the tech space, and those uh, layoffs have affected trust and safety departments as well as lots of other departments uh, across all of the tech companies, and, and Google is, is no exception to that. Um, look, layoffs are not a great thing, uh, and, and sort of nobody enjoys doing them, experiencing them. Obviously, if you're affected by it, it is uh, particularly challenging. Uh, And even if you're not directly affected by it, you lose colleagues and friends, and it's really hard. So, uh, look, I think that um, trusting safety departments are nothing if not nimble and, uh, and creative in terms of how they do their work. We should remember that this didn't really even exist as a discipline, uh, uh, six years ago, seven years ago. I mean, the trust and safety discipline is really about five years old. When I started at Google, we were not called trust and safety. We were actually called product quality operations, a, uh, a, a poetic uh, name uh, <laughs> that rolls off the tongue. Um, so my point is this. This is a discipline that has been growing, that has been evolving, that has been building. More and more people are joining. I think anytime we have uh, tough economic times and a, and a corporate retrenchment, it affects all of us. So we'll have to adjust. But I am, um, I mean, I'm, I'm bullish on trust and safety in, uh, for the future. I think one of the things that we'll all continue to need to do is, and, I, and I, I know we have all collectively been doing this, but I think ar- articulate uh, a, a mission and a value for trust and safety that allows people to understand that we are not a cost center, strictly speaking, or just a cost center. Um, while we might not be specifically in the revenue generation field, that we are vitally important to the business, to uh, to its future growth, uh, to its expansion into new markets, to its responsible unlocking of opportunities in new markets. And I, I think I see us all collectively making that shift and people beginning to understand that, that trust and safety is not a, sort of a nice to have, uh, but a must have. Uh, but again, we're still somewhat early in our journey here. And, uh, and I'm, I, I think the next couple of years, particularly with the uh, rapid uh, rise and deployment of uh, various generative AI products, um, I think I think you'll continue to see the value of uh, trust and safety departments. Great, thank you. So we, I think we have only three minutes. Do you want? <laughs> I am. I don't see the. Uh, oh yes, five. we have five minutes. Five. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I can, you can take the question if you want. <laughs> um, I think it's been very hard to see talented, values-driven people lose roles that they really cared about and that were really fulfilling. And they're losing these roles in a down economy where it's a little harder to bounce back than it was in 2021 or 2020. Uh, I'm encouraged by the support that's risen up from you know, current employees in, in the safety space and former employees. I would give a shout out to uh, Charlotte at the Trust and Safety Professionals Association. Uh, this is the you know professional association for people working in trust and safety. They've done a great job of aggregating jobs on a job board, having training sessions for people who've lost their jobs. And uh, we continue to hire at Discord. So we're looking for a mental health policy manager. We're looking for a European teen safety policy manager. Uh, we have roles in revenue policy and we have roles in Asia Pack. So uh, some of the smaller companies, I think, are still hiring. Great, thank you. So we we uh, we need to wrap up. So in one sentence, uh, Tara, if you can tell, <laughs> I know this is difficult. But so, um, how do you feel about at the present about the state of trust and safety, and how we can provide that globally for everyone? Trust and safety is a vital field and has many complexities as part of it. And I think the most that we can do is continue to lean into the complexity and not be paralyzed by it, while also thinking, what are the opportunities for automation so that we're thinking about moderator well-being, we're thinking about policy and all the people that work in it for their well-being so they're not being given graphic content that they have to deal with day in and day out. So it's balancing these two things. How do you lean into nuance, but also think about the person that's behind the screen that's having to see all of it day in and day out so there are automation opportunities. So I think this is where we can lean into it going forward. That was way more than one sentence, (laughs) but that's all I got. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, since Terry used more than one sentence. I <laughs> uh, look, um, one of the things I, th- I find fascinating about trust and safety is it is it is this really unique interdisciplinary approach to thinking about problems. And as a result, uh, um, there's an opportunity for lots of different types of people with different backgrounds, different perspectives, different educational backgrounds, different fields of study to really engage uh, on some of the most important and pressing problems of, of today. And it's, again, one of the things I love about, about the discipline is we can pull so many diff- people from different walks of life and different fields, uh, all of whom are necessary to meaningfully contribute to solutions uh, to the you know pressing problems that we, we face. So I... I'll say it again. I'm 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 bullish on trust and safety uh, in the future. Uh, recent economic uh, downturn notwithstanding, um, I think that um, we'll see more and more that the types of tools that we are all using to access and th- synthesize and understand information um, will continue to benefit from this cross-disciplinary. Uh, approach to thinking about context, to thinking about the information that we're generating and sharing, and to thinking about how we reflect different cultural norms and regional norms, and thinking about how we simultaneously uh, somehow uh, reflect global frameworks and global values around human rights and around other issues. So there is plenty of work uh, left to be done, so much work left to be done, um, that, I, like I said, I continue to think it's a vital, it's a vital um, field. Thank you. So simply put, we're all in this together when it comes to online safety and it's civil society and it's academics and it's governments, it's companies of all sizes with diverse products. And uh, this week at RightsCon, I think has reinforced us uh, that this collaboration and this dialogue and this working together is the way we're going to solve online safety problems. Great, thank you very much. I think this was a great session. It was sufficiently, I hope I made you sufficiently uncomfortable. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, here is to, uh, for a future for, with trust and safety aligned with human rights principle for everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks.